Hectate examines uh, Scout's costume um, and he says, this thing probably saved her life. Look, um, he pointed with a long forefinger, a shiny clean line stood out on the dull wire. So Bob Ewell obviously tried, used a, a knife or something to kind of slash the, the wire. Um, Bob Ewell meant business, Mr Tate muttered. He was out of his mind, said Atticus. Don't like to contradict you, Mr Finch. Wasn't crazy, mean as hell. Low down skunk with enough liquor in him to make him brave enough to kill children. He'd never have met you face to face. Atticus shook his head. I can't conceive of a man who'd... Mr Finch, there's just some kind of men you have to shoot before you can say Heidi to them. Even then, they ain't worth the bullet it takes to shoot them. Ewell's one of them. To me, that reminds me of the incident where Atticus shoots the dog. Um, you know, the, the idea that you've, you've got to get rid of this threat. It's got to be shot dead. Um, this is like Bob Ewell. He's a threat. You, you have to kill it for that threat to, get, to subside. Scout recounts um, what happened with the scuffle. Um, and then she says that, you know, somebody was staggering around and panting and coughing fit to die. Um, and they ask her who it was. Um, and she says, well, there he is over there. He can tell you his name. Um, so and then she describes the figure in the corner. He was still leaning against the wall. He had been leaning against the wall when I came into the room. His arms folded across his chest. As I pointed, he brought his arms down and pressed the palms of his hands against the wall. They were white hands, sickly white hands that had never seen the sun. So white they stood out garishly against the dull cream wall in the dim light of Jem's room. I looked from his hands to his sand-stained khaki pants. My eyes travelled up his thin frame to his torn shirt. His face was as white as his hands, but for a shadow on his jutting chin. His cheeks were thin to hollowness. His mouth was wide. There were shallow, almost delicate indentations at his temples, and his grey eyes were so colourless I thought he was blind. His hair was dead and thin, almost feathery on top of his head. When I pointed to him, his palms slipped slightly, leaving greasy sweat streaks on the wall, and he hooked his thumbs in his belt. A strange small spasm shook him as if he heard fingernails scrape, slate. But as I gazed at him in wonder, the tension slowly drained from his face. His lips parted into a timid smile, and our neighbour's image blurred with my sudden tears. Hey, boo, I said. Mr Arthur, honey, said Atticus, gently correcting me. Jean Louise, this is Mr Arthur Radley. I believe he already knows you. If Atticus could blandly introduce me to Boo Radley at a time like this, well, that was Atticus. Now they go and sit on the porch to discuss um, what's happened out of the way of Jem. Scout leads Boo through the hall um, and uh, past the living room. Won't you have a seat, Mr Arthur? This rocking chair is nice and comfortable. I led him to the chair farthest from Atticus and Mr Tate. It was in deep shadow. Boo would feel more comfortable in the dark. At this point, Atticus is thinking that Jem is responsible for um, Bob Ewell's death. And what Atticus's reaction is, is dread, because Atticus will not want to shield Jem from the legal consequences of this act. So Atticus's brain goes into legal mode and thinks, my son's killed this man, my son's going to have to, you know, face questioning, potentially some kind of trial... Even if it's self-defense, um, you know, he, he could be charged with manslaughter. Um, I, I can't compromise my judicial position by allowing Heck to cover it up for me. So Atticus, um, to understand this next chapter, you have to understand that Atticus believes that Jem is the one who's responsible. Now, Heck sees immediately that it's Arthur Radley who has done this. Arthur Radley's rescued the children and killed Bob Ewell. And so Heck wants to 
basically cover up what Arthur has done so that Arthur is saved from public scrutiny. Not that that public scrutiny would end badly because actually I think he would probably get a lot of positive public um, applause for rescuing the children. Um, but Heck knows Arthur Radley's personality and his reclusive situation and decides that it's far better in this case to bend the law a little. Now, this is going to harken back to the early chapters where um, Basic Scout doesn't want to go to school. And she's like, well, how come the Ewells don't get to school, um, get to go to school, but, you know, I have to. And Atticus says, well, basically, we bend the rules for the Ewells. You know, we allow them to um, poach some food so they don't starve. Um, we bend the rules for them because they're an exception. But you, you have to go to school. Well, this is a, an, another example of where Hectate is using compassion um, to yeah, bend the rules so that Arthur Radley's identity um, as the killer of Bob Ewell is kept a secret. Now, in this conversation, Atticus is obviously believing that Jem is responsible. So he says, Jem's not quite 13. No, he's already 13. Anyway, it'll come before county court. What will, Mr Finch? Mr Tate uncrossed his legs and leaned forward. Of course, it was clear-cut self-defence, but I'll have to go to the office and hunt up. Mr Finch, do you think Jem killed Bob Ewell? Do you think that? You heard what Scout said. There's no doubt about it. She said Jem got up and yanked him off her. He probably got hold of Ewell's knife somehow in the dark. We'll find out tomorrow. Mr Finch, hold on said Mr Tate. Jem never stabbed Bob Ewell. Atticus was silent for a moment. Heck, it's mighty kind of you. I know you're doing it from that good heart of yours, but don't start anything like that. Mr Tate got up and went to the edge of the porch. He spat into the shrubbery and thrust his hands in his hip pockets and faced Atticus. Like what? he said. I'm sorry if I spoke sharply, Heck, Atticus said simply. But nobody's hushing this up. I don't live that way. Nobody's going to hush anything up, Mr Finch. Mr Tate's voice was quiet. A curious contest, the nature of which eluded me, was developing between my father and the sheriff. Atticus believes that his son Jem is responsible and will have to face some kind of legal consequence. But Heck knows that it's actually Boo Radley who's responsible and Heck is determined to protect that man. Heck, you haven't said it, but I know what you're thinking. Thank you for it. Jean Louise, you said Jem yanked Mr. Rule off you? Yes, sir, that's what I thought. I... See there, Heck? Thank you from the bottom of my heart. But I don't want my boy starting out with something like this over his head. Best way to clear the air is to have it all out in the open. Let the county come and bring sandwiches. I don't want him growing up with a whisper about him. I don't want anybody saying... Jem Finch, his daddy paid a mint to get him out of that. Sooner we get this over with, the better. Mr Finch, Mr Tate said stolidly, Bob Ewell fell on his knife. He killed himself. Atticus walked to the corner of the porch. He looked at the wisteria vine. In his own way, I thought each was as stubborn as the other. I wondered who would give in first. Atticus's stubbornness was quiet and really evident. Mr. Tate's was unschooled and blunt, but it was equal to my father's. Heck, Atticus's back was turned. If this thing's hushed up, it'll be a simple denial to Jem of the way I've tried to raise him. Sometimes I think I'm a total failure as a parent, but I'm all they've got. Before Jem looks at anyone else, he looks at me, and I've tried to live so I can look squarely back at him. If I connived at something like this, frankly, I couldn't meet his eye. The day I can't do that, I'll know I've lost him. I don't want to lose him and Scout because they're all I've got. Mr Finch, Mr Tate was still planted to the floorboards. Bob Ewell fell on his knife. I can prove it. So Atticus is desperately trying to plead with Heck to let him keep his integrity by not fobbing off um, the truth of the matter. And um, Heck Tate says, look, I can show you. He reached in his inside pocket and withdrew a long switchblade knife. 
that the knife that killed him, heck? Dr Reynolds asks. No, sir. Still in him. It looked like a kitchen knife from the handle. It was like this, Mr Tate said. He held the knife and pretended to stumble. See there? Stabbed himself through that soft stuff between his ribs. Whole weight drove it in. Scout is eight years old. She was too scared to know exactly what went on. I'm not saying she made it up. I'm saying she was too scared to know exactly what happened. It was mighty dark out there, black as ink. It'd take somebody mighty used to the dark to make a competent witness. I won't have it, Atticus said softly. I'm not thinking of Jem. Mr Tate's boot hit the floorboard so hard the lights in Miss Mordy's bedroom went on. When Mr Tate spoke again, his voice was barely audible. Mr Finch, I hate to fight you when you're like this. You've been under a strain tonight no man should ever have to go through. Why you ain't in the bed from it, I don't know. But I do know that for once, you haven't been able to put two and two together. And we've got to settle this tonight, because tomorrow will be too late. Bob Ewell's got a kitchen knife in his craw. Mr Tate added that Atticus wasn't going to stand there and maintain any boy Jem's size with a busted arm and fight enough left in him to tackle and kill a grown man in the pitch dark. Heck, said Atticus abruptly, that was a switchblade you were waving. Where'd you get it? Took it off a drunk man, Mr Tate answered coolly. I was trying to remember. Mr Ewell was on me, then he went down. Jem must have gotten up, at least I thought. Heck. I said I took it off a drunk man downtown tonight. Ewell probably found that kitchen knife in the dump somewhere. Honed it down and bided his time. Just bided his time. Now what Heck Tate is doing here is fabricating a story. He's taken the switchblade, which was Bob Ewell's own weapon, away. And the kitchen knife, which Boo Radley used, just the first thing he grabbed, to run out and defend the children, he's going to say that that kitchen knife was Bob Ewell's. So by removing the other weapon, um, it looks like Bob Ewell's fallen on his own knife rather than the truth, which is Boo Radley got the knife, went out and killed him. It's my decision and my responsibility. For once, if you don't see it my way, there's not much you can do about it. Your boy never stabbed Bob Ewell. Mr Tate stopped pacing. I'm not a very good man, sir, but I am sheriff of Maycomb County. Lived in this town all my life and I'm going on 43 years old. Know everything that's happened here since before I was born. There's a black boy dead for no reason and the man responsible for it's dead. Let the dead bury the dead this time, Mr Finch. Let the dead bury the dead. Now what I love here is that sense when Heck Tate is saying... This is like the right thing now. Bob Ewell wrongly accused Tom. Tom is wrongly killed. And Heck Tate's nailing his colours to the mask by saying this. It was very difficult for him to say anything before because obviously he was wrapped up in the trial as a witness. But by saying, look, the way events have turned out, Bob Ewell's now dead. There's justice in that. And I'm happy with that. That's what he's saying. Now, Heck reasons that the reason he doesn't want to the truth to come out about what Boo Radley's done is because everybody would be putting him in the limelight, and that's what he would hate. What Heck Tate says is, all the ladies in Maycomb, including my wife, be knocking on his door bringing angel food cakes. To my way of thinking, Mr Finch, taking the one man who's done you and this town a great service, dragging him with his shy ways into the limelight, to me, that's a sin. It's a sin, and I'm not about to have it on my head. If it was any other man, it'd be different, but not this man, Mr Finch. I may not be much, Mr Finch, but I'm still Sheriff of Maycomb County, and Bob Ewell fell on his knife. Good night, sir. Finally, Atticus turns to Scout. Scout, he said, Mr Ewell fell on his knife. Can you possibly understand? And Scout says, well, it'd be sort of like shooting a mockingbird, wouldn't it? And what Scout has understood in this moment is that giving Boo the credit for killing Bob Ewell would be shooting a mockingbird because if you put in this man who um, stays inside all the time suddenly into the public sphere of Maycomb, which he would absolutely hate, 
And so scouts made that link that that's just the same as killing a mockingbird, just the same as accusing Tom Robinson um, of raping Mayella was killing a mockingbird too. And then the chapter ends with the poignant line as Atticus turns to Boo, he says, thank you for my children, Arthur. Now, this is the moment of completion for Scout where she finishes her journey of maturation. She really understands now um, what her father's been trying to teach her. And ironically, she understands better than her own father at this moment. Um, finally, when all this is over, Boo, Boo says, can you take me home to Scout? And so to save his dignity, Scout puts her arm so that it looks like he's escorting her um, and she's got that sensitivity that perhaps she didn't have before um, and so she walks with Boo back to the Radley house and then walks up the steps to the porch um, Boo goes in and she says I never saw him again um, but what's really interesting is that when she turns to go home she suddenly sees everything differently she's on the Radley porch and she now looks at the street and thinks, I've never seen the neighbourhood from this angle. Um, and basically, she then replays all the events of the novel um, as she stands there and realises what Boo has been seeing. And this is so beautiful because it's exactly what Attica said, isn't it? Way back in the sort of theme statement of the novel, you have to climb into somebody else's shoes to understand them. This is finally what Scout manages to do, literally physically being on the Radley porch, looking at the street. And she kind of reminisces the events that we've seen um, in the novel um, about you know, the children playing, reenacting the drama of, of Boo and the Scissors, um, fighting, getting the gifts in the oak tree, um, you know, all, all of those events all of those events that happened, Atticus shooting the dog. Um, and in the end, um, she says this, Atticus was right. One time he said, you never really know a man till you stand in his shoes and walk around in them. Just standing on the Radley porch was enough. And that, that brings the novel full circle and we understand this key message. And even though for Tom Robinson, there just wasn't any hope really of an acquittal um, with Boo, there is that sense of redemption. It's a partial redemption because his life isn't transformed. He goes back into the house and Scout never sees him again. But I think in terms of um, he does this one great act of bravery to save the children and perhaps that redeems the wrongs that he did in the past. There's a real sense in which Scout can now grow up um, having seen all of the ugliness of Maycomb the disease of prejudice in her own society. She can now learn to show empathy to others and not judge them just as other people around her do. And that, I think, leaves the novel with an ultimate message of positivity and hope for the future. If more of the younger generation can show this empathy, um, there is hope. There is hope that the South can change. Hit subscribe if you'd like to follow my vlog for more updates on teaching, reading and studying.